this sweatshirt made a lot of sense for this video. Hey everyone, I hope y'all are having a great day. Today I'm finally reviewing The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins. And I say finally because although this book has not even been out for two weeks yet, I do think that I'm like the last person to finish it. People finished this book like the day that it came out, which is wild to me because it's like over 500 pages. I'm not that fast of a reader, so I'm always very suspicious of people who are. I'm like, are you really reading all of the words? But that's just me being envious. I do want to say a quick thing about the title, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, because it is quite literally one of the most generic YA titles I have ever seen. I don't know if y'all have seen those memes about generic YA titles and how they always follow this formula of like, like the blank of blank and blank. But at this point in YA, if I see a title of this kind of pattern, I just, I have to roll my eyes. So yeah, this is the prequel to the Hunger Games trilogy. It follows President Snow when he's a teenager, so obviously before he's become president. At this point, he's just Coriolanus, which I know is a name from a Shakespearean tragedy, but truly my sixth grade brain could not not fixate on the same four specific letters of this name, which popped up again in another significant character named Sejanus. Those Romans really care about their suffixes, and Suzanne really cares about signal posting that these people are buttholes. So yes, this book takes place in the year of the 10th annual Hunger Games. In this particular year, the game makers have decided to pair each tribute from the districts with a mentor from the capital. So our main character, Coriolanus Snow, ends up getting paired with who could have guessed the female tribute of District 12? Her name is Lucy Gray Baird, and she's a songwriter slash performer. Now, the problem with this pairing is that, obviously, being the female tribute from District 12, Lucy Gray has absolutely no odds of winning, wink wink, but Coriolanus really needs to win because since the war, the snows have fallen on a lot of financial difficulty. So Coriolanus really needs to perform well as a mentor in order for him to secure what's essentially a scholarship to attend university in the capital. Now, I feel conflicted about this book. I definitely didn't hate it, like a lot of people did, which was surprising to me because at first, I thought that the consensus was that everyone really adored this because the only people I saw on my Twitter timeline and talking about this book, we're saying really positive things about it. But then I checked Goodreads, and on Goodreads, all the top reviews are like one star, two stars. They're all really disappointed or really frustrated. And I don't think this book warrants that. I don't think it's an incredible book, and it's definitely, definitely not as strong as the books in the original trilogy, but I still found it really interesting. Now, interesting is different than entertaining. I would not say that this book is particularly entertaining, which is part of the reason why it took me over a week to finish reading. The other part of the reason being that for four days I drove to and back from Nashville because I finally got permission to retrieve my things from my dorm. When I was reading this book, I only read maybe a chapter, two at most, at a time. Because although the questions it raises are intriguing, it's not what I would call a compelling book. But there are so many ambiguities here that make it an excellent book for reflecting on and simmering over. I saw one reviewer mention that this book was unnecessary because why would we want to see Snow's character arc when we already know where he ends up? Which seems like less of a criticism of this book specifically and more of like an issue with prequels in general. I actually really enjoyed getting to see Snow's character better. I think what was scary for me was seeing how easily Coriolanus could shift in and out of being a sympathetic character. He definitely has like a woe is me attitude, like, oh, I'm so poor, my parents both are dead, etc. Which honestly, we're not that deeply explored. Coriolanus like never goes hungry and he never feels that moved by the fact that none of his parents are alive. So like sometimes he's pitiful, but he's never not ambitious. Regardless of where he's at in life or what his status looks like, he always has this inherent driving impulse of how can I restore greatness to my family name? And he obviously goes about it in horrible means, but I will say that I love a character with drive and agency. Let's not get things twisted. He's manipulative garbage a lot of the time. Maybe I'm about to expose myself by saying this, but I didn't necessarily hate it all the time. Sometimes I would find myself rooting for him and wanting him to succeed, which again, is not a good realization for my own moral health, but Coriolanus is so excellent at making himself out to be a protagonist. I think this book is a perfect example of how the difference between a protagonist and an antagonist is simply the perspective of telling. It is absolutely impressive the way Collins has crafted Coriolanus' character in this book. He walks all sorts of lines, embodies all sorts of paradoxes, and he does it in a way that's so completely intentional and so scary to see. I think maybe the biggest issue of this book is its pacing. The pacing of this book is 
very wonky. It's over 500 pages long, and it seems like it's going to be about the Hunger Games, but the Hunger Games don't actually start until past page 200, and then they end around page 300. Right? So that means 80% of this story takes place outside of the games. The Hunger Games itself, like as a competition in the story, is not that exciting. And maybe that's because the institution of the games is not fully set up yet. It's still relatively new. It's only their 10th time doing it. They haven't yet ironed out the kinks to make it the polished killing sports machine that we see that it is in Katniss's time. So I will be a little lenient there, but the 200 pages before the games really could have been shaved down. There was a lot of extra position, a lot of um, trying to show you that this Pan Am is different than the Pan Am we know through Katniss's story. And another big issue I had was that there were just far, far too many characters. I was always flipping back to the list of all the tributes and all their paired mentors, which by the way, those characters alone are 48 characters. That's 48 characters without counting any of those characters' family members that we meet, game makers, political figures, faculty at the school. It was just far too many characters for me to keep track of, especially because a lot of them are frankly not that important and they only say like a line or two here and there. Too many characters and too many lyrics. Oh my God. Like I get it. Lucy Gray is a singer. She's a songwriter. She's a performer, but oh my God. Suzanne Collins, for some reason, felt the need to include the lyrics to every song she sang in full. Like there are scenes where Lucy performs like in essentially a concert and we'd get three or four songs in a row. The number of times I had to read the lyrics to The Hanging Tree, far too many, too many, Suzanne. Okay, back to the pacing. The post-games evolution of Coriolanus's character seemed to come at an uneven pace too. I can understand the bridge of introducing violence as a means of survival. Like up to that point, I'm with you, I can understand, but I wasn't fully with Suzanne Collins when she transitioned Coriolanus's violence into that which seemed pretty unnecessary and just for like mild convenience. The last section of the book, both in plot and in like character development, I guess, moves from zero to 100 within seconds. And that's a difficult thing to bridge. I'm not fully convinced that Collins showed Snow crossing that bridge with enough motivation or analysis. Something else that struck me as odd, especially reading this during this time of incredible racism in America, you know, shown by authority figures from the literal president to city police force, is that there is no discussion of race at all in this book. No characters are described by their coloring, their ethnicity, or their heritage. It's just who they're related to and how much money do they have. Conflict is entirely based upon this divide between capital and district and who has economic power, who has access to means and resources, and who doesn't. And this economic struggle being the main conflict makes sense in a story like Parasite when everyone's the same ethnicity, but in a setting that's supposed to be future America. The lack of mention of any sort of racial dynamic feels very hard to believe. Of course, you can always imply that poorer districts have more minority communities, which I think is what happens in the original series. I haven't reread it in a while, so I can't confirm. But to not say anything explicitly about something that has been in play in America's history since its beginning and will last in American politics for probably forever, very weird. Very weird to me. Like there is really no future in which American politics does not in some way incorporate race. It was weird for something so big to be so unaddressed. But anyway, as I've said, clearly this book isn't perfect, but it's so interesting to read and reflect on. It's a book I'm glad I didn't fly through because the more I sat with it, the longer I could mull over the things that Suzanne Collins was implicitly asking. This book poses questions like, what's the line between doing something for survival and doing something that's irredeemable? When can we accurately judge a person's character? When we see them at their lowest or once we've seen them overcome something and they're on the up again? Is it fair to make any sort of conclusion about what's at the core of human nature when these things are being elicited in forced, unnatural settings. And of course, when it gets to Coriolanus and his very odd romance with Lucy Gray, what is the moral balance of doing something good for someone else because it's also good for you? There are really countless questions that you could ask while reading this book, what makes a villain? What makes a hero? Who's a protagonist? What makes an anti-hero? When do we love to see characters fight for themselves and when are they just being selfish? Lots of complicated questions. One of my favorite things about Suzanne Collins is that I never think that she dumbs down politics or tension or moral ambiguity for the sake of a younger audience. She somehow makes it both complex and digestible 
and I applaud that a lot because that's very hard to do. So I don't love this book. I don't think it's nearly as good as the original Hunger Games trilogy, but I do think it's an interesting experiment. I really don't hate it, like, at all. And I feel like the people who do maybe think that Collins is posing too obvious of questions, but I don't know. Maybe it's the fact that I secretly think I'm Slytherin, even though I always get sorted into Ravenclaw and Gryffindor, that makes me think that Snow is a very interesting character. And I don't hate him all the time. And I loved that part of my reading experience. So I think those are all my thoughts on the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. I already know, I already know that I missed a lot of talking points because there is so much to talk about in this book, but hopefully you'll bring up something that I didn't think about when I was reading. And I would love to talk about this book in the comments with you. So please let me know your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you'll have a fantastic day and happy reading. Bye.